it just makes me happy. It's my way of performing, but not in front of an audience. It's my way of uh, stress release. It's my way of ex expressing creativity. I just love the ballet and the music. Hey dancers, welcome to the show. I'm Julie and I'm your host today on this episode of Broche Banter. I both own and teach at Broche Ballet, a virtual ballet school just for adults. Join us as we explore all things adult ballet. If you're enjoying these stories of the wonderful adult dancers in our community, please help us keep the podcast going by nominating a friend to be on the show. Send us an email at hello at brocheballet.com to let us know who we should invite on the show next. Today on the show, I chat with Denise. Ballet has been in her heart for decades since the age of six, but flat feet, pigeon toes, a stroke, a horseback riding accident, and a tornado have all kept her away from the bar. Until now. And she couldn't be happier dancing the days away. Enjoy Denise's fascinating story of how she's finally found her way to the bar. Before we get to the show, let's take our broche bite. On this segment, we'll talk about bite-sized ballet tidbits to give you something to chew on while you listen. Today, let's talk about the different ballet methods. Kind of like accents, within a single language, ballet has a few different flavors. There are the Vaganova method from Russia, the Cicchetti method from Italy, the French or Nureyev method, the Bournonville method from Denmark, RAD or Royal Academy of Dance from the UK, and Balanchine from America. There are, of course, even more different styles and preferences within those. Some of these methods have different body positions, names for things, and arm positions. Some emphasize different elements of ballet, such as fast footwork or a palmal, which means shouldering. There are also differences in how the curriculum is advanced and even how turning is executed. Now, on to the show. Well, Denise, welcome to the show. I am thrilled to have you on today to hear about your story. It is quite the story, so we are going to get into it. So, welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. So, Denise, you dance in um, our online studio. I met you very early on in quarantine. You were one of our first members who joined, who wasn't with us in Denver. Um, and you've been in almost all of the classes ever since then, <laughs> um, except for the ones that are past bedtime. Um, you tell me about where when you started ballet because it wasn't with me it was a little bit before well I can go way back to when I was six years old <laughs> did you like and, it when you were six did you do it a little bit when you were six and I even have a picture of me doing my first arabesque oh isn't that adorable at six and I still have my first ballet shoes oh that's so, so. cute but anyway, I took a few ballet lessons and got hooked at an early age. Then I, my love of ponies took over. My parents bought a farm and we moved out of town. But all through my life, um, my parents were really fond of music. And there was always music in our house, which kind of plays into it too. Mm -hmm. um, my mother would sit at the piano and play Gershwin and Irving Berlin songs. My father would be over in the corner tap dancing and imitating Louis Armstrong. And he had this move where he'd kick his leg up over the back of the chair <clears throat> to show you how agile and fit he was. And it really is reminiscent of a grand bottom aunt. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> you know, and he had a little soft shoe routine. So my parents made a big impression on me with music and dance. And they took me to every Broadway musical that they could find. And I really enjoyed watching the performers. Um, I knew that I couldn't do that because I grew up with some foot and leg problems, namely flat feet, pigeon toes, um, which grew into great big bunions and all these horrible things and had to wear orthopedic shoes in the seventh grade. In the seventh grade, when you want to dress cool and wear the cool clothes, I was wearing these saddle shoes, black and white saddle shoes with the great big thick heels. So that kind of ruined my ballet dream for me. So we bought a farm and we moved 
a little south and I got into horses and of course <clears throat> boys came into the picture. And I always wanted to get back into ballet, but I was very shy about it because of my feet. Mm. And, um, they've even been called flippers. Mm. So I would never really take that step. So when I finally got back into ballet, I was in my early 30s and I found a, a lady down here who had a studio in her home. And I took a few lessons with her and I was really excited. Next thing you know, I became pregnant. And in those days, you didn't exercise when you were pregnant. Oh. It was risky. So I stopped ballet. And <clears throat> then I wanted to get back into it after the children were grown. And I was just so busy with three of them, three boys, that I put that on. <laughs> and then things fell apart. I got a divorce and had to re-enter the workforce after 22 years at home. So to do that, I, I was a teacher, and I had to go back and get recertified, and then I had to learn to operate computers. Mm -hmm. Had to take uh, computer classes, recertification classes, and work full time. So again, no time for ballet. Around what time, was, what year was that when you were re-entering the workforce? 1994. Okay, so computers were still in their earlier form, kind of clunky and not, not so yeah. easy to operate. Yeah. yeah. So, and then you had to continue learning, of course, to use them in the classroom mm -hmm. <clears throat> to do things with them. What age did you teach at that point? Uh, first grade. Okay. And then later I moved out of the classroom and became a gifted education resource teacher, mm -hmm. which encompassed kindergarten through fifth. So I had to keep on training myself, keep on learning. Mm -hmm. So in the midst of all this, one day in my classroom, I totally came back from lunch. My lunch tray fell out of my hand. I didn't know what was happening. I ran next door to the teacher next door, frantically waving my hands, trying to get her attention, and found out I was having a stroke. So I actually had my stroke in my classroom in 2002. Wow. And that was a life changer. Yeah, I bet. It was terrifying. I was helicoptered to Georgetown. Uh, I could not speak. I lost my <clears throat> voice. And my whole right side was paralyzed. So I was scared to death. So after months of rehab and physical therapy, I only could walk again after learning to walk on a walker. Wow. But I did have residual effects from the stroke. Were you remarried at that point or were you, oh, look at your mug. That's our, that's our studio mug. Cute. <laughs> were you remarried at that point or were you going solo through all of this? I was going solo. Wow. But were your kids nearby or were you really just kind of on your own trying to figure out? They were living they were living where? With me. Oh, with me. Okay. Okay. Oh, the crazy And they were all in middle school. So it was a really rough time for us, all of us. Oh, so they weren't grown yet. You were taking care of them no. while they were going on. Oh, my goodness. In beginning high school. Mm -hmm. so I survived all that. And um, when all that was over with, I, um, again, tried to get back into ballet, but there was nothing in this area except um, the community college. So I enrolled in those classes, took, a, took two semesters, actually, mm. and found myself dancing with 18 and 19-year-olds who were dance majors. Oh, boy. <laughs> that must be intimidating. <laughs> it was intimidating. <clears throat> so... At that point, had you, had you entirely rehab from the stroke, like you had most of your function back, or was your right yeah. side having trouble, or how were you feeling? It took a while, but I eventually got my right side back. Mm -hmm. And let me back up. <clears throat> Before I started taking ballet, I had a horseback riding accident. After and I've been riding since I was 10 years old, done it my whole life. 
and had a freak accident while fox hunting. I came out of the saddle backwards and sideways and landed right on the top of my humerus, <clears throat> which shattered. Um, the doctor said they couldn't operate. It was too broken up, too shattered. There'd be too many pins, too many plates. And if they operated, the whole um, humerus may collapse. So there were no guarantees. So their advice was to let it heal naturally. So I was in a sling and my shoulder froze, my elbow froze. It was so horrendously painful. But <clears throat> before that, I had been doing ballet to this tape. I don't know if you've heard of her, Elise Goulan. I've been doing this actually ballet conditioning exercises. I was doing that, still dreaming of getting back. But after the riding accident, I thought, this is over. This is the end. Yeah, I bet. That's terrifying. I didn't give up horses. But anyway, <clears throat> my shoulder did heal naturally, but it healed attaching itself to the scapula. So the scapula and the shoulder move as one unit and don't move very well. I see. So I can't raise my arm. And although sometimes you'll see me try mm -hmm. to go and hide it's just because I have to do it because it looks so fun and feels so good. <laughs> but anyway, um, I took so much physical therapy, years and years of physical therapy, and it would improve slightly, but I could never raise it again. Mm -hmm. And ended up rupturing my bicep, being taken to the emergency room for that. Wow, because oh. you were trying to, how did you rupture it? Were you trying to do something? I was on a machine, <clears throat> almost like a rowing machine where you, pull your whole weight up with your arms. And I was doing really well. They told me it was very high level exercise. And I was almost ready to graduate physical therapy. And evidently it just pulled the biceps so hard it ruptured. Wow. <laughs> to add insult to injury, geez. <laughs> just can't win. No. How did how were you how were you feeling at that point? Was that pretty was that were you discouraged? I mean, how, how was your oh, emotional state? I was okay. devastated. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah, that's tough. It's a long haul. <laughs> so <laughs> you're going through all of that. What, I mean, obviously you, you were telling us the tale today, so you made it through. What did you, how did you do, how did you get through it? What, did you have something you told yourself? Did you have something that you would, go to to get you through that time how in the world did you make it through that much um, mental and physical anguish probably my husband gets all the credit <clears throat> very positive person and kept encouraging me mm -hmm. yeah that would be really really hard to get through yeah so how many years ago how many years ago was that now that was in 2013. Okay. So that's, that's years Six, seven years ago. Okay. Yeah. And I always thought I'd get back to riding, but now I'm taking blood thinners. And <clears throat> of course, doctors say no horses and blood thinners. They don't mix. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Good to know. Yeah. Were you still working at that point, teaching, or when did yes. that? Yeah. But shortly after that, after that, I retired because my handwriting was affected. I had a visual impairment from the stroke mm. and couldn't write on the board. I could barely lug my laptop around. So it just all became too much. Mm -hmm. So I retired. And you're right. Are you right handed? Yes. So all this time with your right arm being out of commission must have been very yeah. challenging. Yeah. But I've trained myself to use the mouse with my left hand. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. That seems complicated. <laughs> so you have, um, you started ballet again at some point. Did you start, you started again, again before you found me in the most recent yeah. past. That was about two years before when I took the classes at the college and the senior center. I see. Then when the yeah. pandemic hit, I thought, oh no, everything's closed. I'm not going to get back to ballet. <laughs> and I've been, um, perusing your website shortly before the pandemic. And I thought, gee, this sounds really neat, but do I really have the nerve to take the introductory lesson? <laughs> I was scared to death of that. So 
then when I saw you were going online, I was trying to figure out how I could get to Denver. But that wasn't going to work either. So <laughs> when you went online, I went, wow, this is really neat. I can do this if she accepts me. So. Well, you made it to the introductory lesson, and we had a good time kind of talking through your arm and what we could do instead of having to raise it. And then you've basic, I mean, you've, you've been coming, I don't know, maybe five, five, six months, you've been coming multiple times a week to, to keep learning. And you've got a little dance floor and a little bar set up area. Yeah, I'm really obsessed with it. <laughs> I just love the music. I love the, just the movement. I even love the technical aspect of it. It's very hard. It's difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but I enjoy learning. So it's, it's good for me. Do you still have residual, um, I know we have residual challenges with your shoulder, but do you still have residual challenges from, um, from the stroke uh, when, you're, when you're learning the body movements and kind of trying to learn these really precise things? Yes, I have a, a visual loss in my left eye of um, 25%. Mm. So if I look up, all I see is a black spot, and they told me that's where the clot escaped. Wow. From carotid artery into the visual artery and nothing can be done about that thankfully it's in the upper right quadrant so i can still drive okay doesn't affect me too terribly much and then i've got visual loss in my right eye from the horse accident called a vitreous detachment wow so you have these floaters and flashers going on all the time but other than that um Thankfully, all my damage is on the right side with the shoulder and the stroke. And I have difficulty, as you can probably tell, um, moving my legs and arms quickly. Mm -hmm. Like during the past numbers, I just can't keep up. I'm doing better. Because when I first started, I couldn't keep up at all. I'm doing better. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I know my legs and arms are flailing, so I just can't get the control of them at the same time on my right side. Mm -hmm. Like you said, just keep on smiling and keep on dancing and do the best you can. Thankfully, I don't have mirrors in my practice area and you don't have mirrors in the studio that I can see. So. Yeah, no, I don't have mirrors in here. When I, when we had the studios in Denver, there were mirrors in the studios, but you know, it's interesting you bring up mirrors. So many people, uh, mirrors are such a staple of a dance studio, right? You think of a quintessential yeah. dance studio and there's walls and walls of mirrors. But so much um, debate is that, you know, it happens around mirrors actually and in, in the recent past where if you, uh, as a dancer, <clears throat> when you train with mirrors and then you try to go and dance on stage where there's no mirrors, if you haven't actually been practicing balancing without seeing yourself, it's actually yeah. pretty hard to balance without the mirror. Um, so if you've learned balance only by looking in the mirror to see your alignment, you won't feel it in your own body. So it's actually really interesting. When I had seen many, many dancers in the Denver studio, then we all went online and then I saw them in person again for a brief period of time. Everyone's balance had gotten better because they weren't looking in a mirror for three months and they were feeling it inside their body. So I'm not, I have, as you know, I haven't encouraged any of our dancers to get mirrors at home because I'm just curious to continue the experiment and see how it goes without mirrors. That's interesting because I, I thought that I definitely needed one. So I snuck a little one, which is about as wide as this iPad. The position I have everything, I can't see but one foot in it sometimes. Right. And I'm sitting watching you with my left eye and trying to watch myself with my right eye. It just doesn't work at all. So, <laughs> it's a lot to get a lot. Using mirrors, when I went in the senior center, they have a beautiful studio. Mirrors on all four walls and a dance floor. And I was really shy about using those. Then I got adapted to them, and they were very helpful. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, there are too many other things to watch. But I'm, what, you know, I'm constantly wondering if I'm doing it right if I'm balancing and I feel like I'm leaning way over the side if I'm wondering if I'm you know I need to look sometimes right it is it is definitely helpful I, it's helpful to see if you know the teacher tells you your hips aren't square but you believe they are and then you look in the mirror and you're like oh okay they're not square so yeah. they don't always feel the same way 
It's like trying to look at you giving instruction and trying to look out at your arm. You know, doing tandu is like, whoa. <laughs> it's a lot happening. <laughs> a little challenging. So you also survived a tornado. What is that about? Yeah, um, the tornado struck our town the day I was released from the hospital from the stroke. And we drove home a two-hour drive, and the winds are whipping up. The sky was getting dark. And nobody thought a lot of it because the last tornado here was in 1926. And went in the house with my walker and sat on the sofa. My husband pulled all the shades so I wouldn't see the baseball-sized hail balls falling down. Shut everything so I wouldn't hear the train roar that you customarily hear. And the tornado struck, totally devastated our entire town and the house I used to live in before this one. So it was, it was terrible. It's been 18 years now since the stroke and the tornado. But, you know, the power went out. The next day, my husband tried to go into town to get some milk at 7-Eleven, uh, and there wasn't one. It was just, the town was gone. There wasn't a 7-Eleven. There, there wasn't no, the town was destroyed for miles and miles. Oh, so your house is okay, but the entire, like the whole, when you go into town, it was all just gone. Our house was on a small hill, and I think that saved us. Yeah. And the house is in my neighborhood. Now, by that time, um, the children were pretty much on their own. But it was, it was, it was unbelievable. <clears throat> we didn't have phones or anything for about two weeks. It's awful. Oh, and meanwhile, you're, you had just gotten back from the hospital from the stroke. Yeah. Wow. So is, okay, so obviously we're going through this pandemic. It, compared with everything else that's happened in your life, is this like peanuts or is this also still challenging? Just one more thing. <laughs> <laughs> just one more thing. I don't like it, but um, I think I can get through it because there's no place I'd really rather be than quarantined at my home. Because I'm a real homebody, and everything I want and need is here. My animals, we've got some acreage so I can get outside and do what I want. Um, things I miss are the people. Mm -hmm. And going shopping, going to a restaurant. But, you know, I thought this would be a two-week stint, and now it's going into six months. So it's getting a little hard. Right, with really no end in sight either, six months. With I know. Yeah. Very worried. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, you've been through so much already, as you said. I mean, it's just, <laughs> just added <laughs> on. <laughs> My husband says ballet has saved his life because I haven't killed him yet because he's in the other room teleworking every single day. <laughs> so um, two more questions for you today. Um, why uh, ballet's been in your heart for your whole life, right? So why... Aspen. Uh, why do you why do you love it so much? Um, it just makes me happy. It's just, I guess it's my way of performing, but not in front of an audience. It's my way of uh, stress release. It's my way of ex expressing creativity. I just love the ballet and the music, and I love the new remastered music that a couple of the artists have made. I don't know. It's been like a virus, you know, <laughs> lying in my system, and every now it pops out. <laughs> <laughs> every once in a while it gets enough strength and it comes out yeah. again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what really captures your attention when you're in class? What do you find to be like the most exciting part or, or fun part about being in a class? I think um, concentrating on all the technique that I'm learning and you're teaching, I mean, I find it fascinating. Um, I just thought you would go in and move your legs and arms and that was it. But I mean, a tondu looks simple. All the steps to make that tondu happen are unbelievably difficult. Mm -hmm. 
controlling your foot and those tiny muscles and understanding those muscles and how they work together. I find it fascinating. And the stretch classes and different muscles that work together that we work on in there. And I love how they're tailored to the ballet movements. Because I tried yoga and I tried exercise classes, but they weren't really what I wanted or needed. And I, I think it's really neat that I can see my body changing. I can feel my abs or what I have of them actually firming up in my little little tiny calves. My husband used to say the wrestlers got them. I didn't have any. And now I'm not self-conscious about wearing short skirts anymore. I see little tiny calves forming. That's so funny. <laughs> I, love, I love the ballet clothes. That's an adventure, just putting this outfits together. Mm -hmm. It's just really neat being able to move both sides of my body, which are not always in sync. But at least they can both move now. Yeah. So that's your thing for me. Um, that's that's really that's really sweet. I think the ballet is really all encompassing with the mind and the body, and it is kind of the ultimate yeah. connection of mind and body, right? Mind, body, and music. I guess you can add that component in there too. I never knew it was so so difficult. Then how much you figure out? like the eight body positions. Oh my gosh, I have a book about those. And so far I've gotten three halfway committed to memory. I mean, I think it's, it's fascinating how intense it is mm -hmm. and how performers have to know all that and retain all that and remember it. It's just mind boggling to me. Mm -hmm. And then how it's taught too, right? So, so much of it is the oral tradition, right? So much of class is taught. Absolutely. Just yeah. telling you what I know, and I got it from someone telling me what they know. Yeah. And there's some books and some pieces that you can fill in with written form, but so much of it is just passed down. And of course, being in another language also. I had one year of French in high school, and they didn't teach us ballet terminology. <laughs> well, I think even if you know French, you're, you don't oh, understand... I Right, you won't know that the, the horse step is the, you know, yeah. movement of the foot. Now, that I should be really good at, because I did it my whole life. <laughs> right, Cheval, yes. Yeah. I used to play horses as a little girl. That's the one way where blood thinners and horses go together, is pas de Cheval. Yes, yes. Um, what, okay, so you've been through, you've been through, so much, but somehow through all of it, you've always found your way back to ballet. Um, what? What advice do you have for anyone listening to us today about life or ballet or anything you want to say to, to, the, to the world? Oh, gee. If I could make people know and feel that ballet is not unapproachable, because mm. I thought it was, it's a select little click and you had to have this qualification, that qualification. I think now it's really embrace the public and anyone can get involved. I don't know how far you may go if you don't have the passion or the interest, but I think it's really neat that anybody can get involved in it if they want to. Um, I hope I can inspire others by seeing that they don't have to be physically perfect because I'm far from it. And I think you should go out and take that chance and see if it's for you. Mm -hmm because it's very important for your whole, your whole mindset in your whole life. And just to remember a few little steps or routines and just, you know, be cleaning or outside doing something and just break into a little three-step center uh, dance that you taught us is really rewarding for me. That's awesome. I, I love that so much. And I, I know people will be inspired by your story and, um, you know, how, how far you've come from all the things that life has thrown at you to still continue following your dream this whole entire time and now making the most of this crazy situation that we're all in by just diving in head first and really going for it. Well, thank you. Thank you, Denise. This was so much fun. I loved hearing your story. It's been a pleasure to be on the show. Thanks for listening today, dancers. 
For more adult ballet, you can follow our studio on Instagram and Facebook at Broche Ballet. You can follow me on Instagram at Julie the Ballerina or check out our blog and YouTube channels for more content. You can even dance with us in our online studio with daily live Zoom classes, private lessons, and our on-demand video library. Don't forget to have your story featured on our podcast. Email us at hello at brocheballet.com. I'm Julie Gill, and this was Broche Banter. Happy dancing! <laughs>